My name is Crystal Emerald Hansley. I'm a junior political science major from Great. Brooklyn, New York. And um, I like your comment, what you said, like you're shaking things up and we have to be prepared to lead. Um, with the recent, I know, with your experience with the Al Gore campaign as campaign manager, I know you understand how important contributions are and money is for, you know, winning an election. So with the recent Supreme Court decision that basically unbanned, you know, contributions that corporations can give to candidates, how would that impact African Americans and us who, who want to leave, you know, but we don't have any money. So what hope do we have? Like, If you saw the State of the Union last night when the President mentioned uh, how awful this decision was, uh, Justice Alito said basically that's not true. He didn't shout you lie, but he Whatever. Um, it is a very devastating um, decision, uh, in large part because uh, money is not the problem with, with, with modern American politics. There's a lot of money in the system. Unfortunately, the money goes to a, a, a choice few candidates, and it goes to pollute the waters. It doesn't really stir more uh, interest in, into the electoral process. It, it really will go toward diminishing interest in the, po in, in, in the public sphere and will be used for negative campaigning. So I'm hopeful that the Democratic majority, uh, we lost a seat, but we didn't lose our values. And I hope the Democrats understand the difference between losing a seat, and it was a very important seat, but we shouldn't lose our values. But I'm hoping that the Democrats can put forward legislation to um, bring back some, rational, some rationality in our current campaign finance system, starting with outlawing any foreign uh, contributions into our electoral process. Can you imagine if, no offense, but if, if one foreign country decided they wanted to pour $75 million in a few congressional races? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so this is a great concern, and that's why we have to back efforts uh, by Chris Van Hollen of, of Maryland and Chuck Schumer of New York. They, they've introduced legislation and uh, we need to back that legislation. But even more, we need to also call on these corporations. You know, I'm the CEO of, Ex uh, of Enron or Exxon. We need to make sure that they stand behind their ads if they're going to pollute the, the political waters. So we've got a lot of work to do, and I hope you stay involved in the process. We need more people of color in this whole uh, area of campaign finance. And thank, thank you. you, and good luck with your future. Thank you. Be yes. Before the next question, I'm sorry. Um, uh, Ms. Brazil is going to have to leave. I'm giving myself, I'm giving, I, I wrote okay? a column too. I, told you I got okay. up early with my right. friend. <laughs> I know CNN's at three. I, my column is due at two. We got, you know, I'm a, I'm a multitasker. Typical black female. I'm <laughs> All right. I'm not on this campus a lot. I got I to gotta get my love and, you know, then I go and, and deal with Anderson or Rick Sanchez or Wolf today. Yes. <laughs> Uh, first, I want to say it's a humbling honor to be here today. Thank I you, appreciate sir. your presence. Uh, my name is Melek Thomas. I'm a senior communication and culture major. Uh, and I, I have a question. Um, uh, when Dr. King died, he was fighting to uh, alleviate the situation of those trapped in the tight vacuum of urban poverty. Uh, and last night in a State of the Union address, we hear President Obama uh, addressing a political allegiance to the middle class. Now, if Dr. King died helping out the most vulnerable of society, I, I don't believe that we've yet to see a concerted effort by this administration to alleviate urban poverty conditions that, that breed the poor health, that breed the gun violence, that breed the gang violence as we see with Darian Albert in Chicago. So my question is, when does that call to serve that you spoke about come to the black community as being a call to uh, holding all of our leaders, including President Obama, accountable for, uh, for being our leader because we too are Americans? Thank you. I, 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 don't, I don't believe that we should ever rest. We should ever rest um, uh, after an election. That is the moment of the greatest accountability. And, and let me say, as, as someone who has looked at every program offered by the president, there are many initiatives. And, and not only his stimulus package, his education package, his housing package, that would, would, would go a long way in alleviating the poverty that we know. For example, had the stimulus not been passed, 33 million Americans would have been faced with living beneath the poverty level. 
that's why I think the president had to act. I don't like the rhetoric that we often used that we say we're fighting for the middle class, but we're not fighting for the poor. Uh, Dr. King never would have tired of saying poor, poverty. But still, we know that politicians feel more comfortable saying middle class. And I know this sounds strange, but we've, we've interviewed during our political, my political career, people who live below the poverty line. And they often want to be referred to as working class Americans. They don't want to be referred to as poor. And I learned that the hard way when I was writing my book and my family said, don't refer to us as poor, we were working. Because <laughs> poor people often work every day. They just don't, they can work two jobs and, and try to make ends meet, but we know that, you know, they're underwater still. But I do think that the president proposals, some of the economic proposals will go a long way in lifting many of our people in our communities out of poverty. But you know, we have to be the generation that brings to our community several of these initiatives. For example, broadband, $8.9 billion to connect every neighborhood. We put it in for a proposal through the District of Columbia to have our libraries up in Northeast Washington, D.C. I live off of Capitol Hill. We want to have our libraries connected. Now, if the district go about requesting these funds or a nonprofit, that means that somebody got to come and what? Connect, dig up, and of course, make this library more tech friendly and then buy computer. There are a whole bunch of jobs associated with connecting libraries. And yet, if our leadership don't work together from the local level all the way to the highest levels, we will not find ways to lift our community up. Second thing, uh, I support government initiatives as because I'm a taxpayer in America and I believe that our money and our resources should not only help those at the, at the top, but should help everyone. But at the same time, we, we need to also call on corporate America, the banks, Citibank, Bank of America, Watch COVID, all these banks that borrowed from us to stay afloat should allow us to borrow back from them to create jobs and opportunities uh, and that's what the president was saying last night, that he's now going to put the, the rest of the TARP money, about $75 million, into community banks that service the community that will lend to small businesses. So we need to have a partnership between the public sector and the private sector. And then lastly, we have to rebuild our own institutions in our own community. Too many of them are fragile, <laughs> self-serving looking for a bigger piece of property so they can take the church from here to there. We have to do a better job of looking inward before we go outward so that we strengthen the, the institutions that have always given up us breath and wings. So I think it's not either or. We constantly keep the heat on. That's why I say Dr. King would march. You, you didn't see my speech. I didn't say Dr. King would roll over and just keep clapping. No, Dr. King would march. He would have left that platform quicker than I did and ran over to ABC. He would have said, I will, I'm going over to announce the march. <laughs>